All right, we're uh, winding up our day here. We're going to hear the recorded remarks that Senator Reed so graciously provided us, and then we'll do our last panel. Uh, thank you all for helping us sort of kind of stick to, stick to our schedule. This has been a very challenging, ambitious agenda, but I, I hope you're all getting as much out of it as I am. Thank you, President Champagne and Dean Logan, for the invitation to speak at this conference at Roger Williams University. I'd like to acknowledge Senator Whitehouse, who you heard from earlier today, and to thank Dean Logan and Director Faraday for putting together this conference. The topics you are engaging in today are both important and timely. Almost one year has passed since the explosion on the Deepwater Horizon, which tragically took the lives of 11 people, eventually spilling over 4 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico and causing tens of billions of dollars in economic damages. Our communities still feel the impacts from that disaster. And it is important that we hold accountable those who are responsible for the devastation and also learn from the mistakes so that history itself does not repeat itself. In Rhode Island, we know firsthand the devastating impacts of an oil spill on our economy and coastal resources. In 1996, our state suffered after the North Cape oil spill off southern Rhode Island. The 1996 North Cape oil spill occurred when the 340-foot North Cape oil barge ran aground off Moonstone Beach after its tug caught fire during a severe winter storm. Over 828,000 gallons of home heating oil spilled into local waters, killing an estimated 9 million lobsters, millions of surf clams, fish, birds, and other organisms. Scientists from the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recommended protecting female lobsters to eventually replace the estimated 9 million lobsters killed by the oil spill. Through the collaborative effort by Rhode Islanders and federal agencies, our coastal environment was cleaned up and our state's lobsters and shellfish populations have been built back up after the North Cape oil spill. I hope that the experience gained in Rhode Island can help with the efforts in the Gulf of Mexico. And I am pleased to note that scientists and researchers from Rhode Island and the New England region, including the University of Rhode Island's research vessel, the Endeavor, assisted with the assessment of the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill was a national wake-up call to improve the government's oversight of the drilling industry, and I was pleased to see the Miner Minerals Management Service broken up to separate the inspection and permitting divisions from the Royalty Collection Division. In order to ensure better oversight and help ensure the safety of their operations, I believe that the companies that tap oil and gas reserves on federal taxpayer property should pay their fair share of drilling royalties and inspection fees. These were among the first recommendations in the National Commission's report on the oil spill and are important steps to further the effort to protect taxpayers, the economy, and the environment. These natural resources belong to the American people, and we need to ensure that big oil companies are paying fair market value for the right to drill on public lands. Modest user fee increases would help prevent future oil spills and ensure the American people are fairly compensated. The administration's proposed budget includes a six-fold increase in the fees oil companies pay for deep water rig inspections. For example, fees on facilities with one to ten wells would increase from $3,250 to $17,000. This additional funding will help the agency hire over 100 new inspectors and engineers to help ensure the safe and secure production of offshore resources. During a hearing I chaired last month on the Department of Interior's 2012 budget, I noted how modest those increases will be for the big oil companies, and also I noted my surprise at how strongly the big oil companies oppose these increases. Just as a comparison, BP, which had Gulf of Mexico, Mexico revenues last year of $10.9 billion, is being asked to pay under this new scheme about $1.5 million. That is 0.01% of their revenues. Similarly, Shell Oil, which made $6.1 billion in the Gulf last year, is being asked to pay $1.8 million, or 0.03% of their gross revenues. These fees accrue benefits 
to these companies and the American public by providing for more thorough inspections and more confident leasing. And I am just surprised that this would be greeted by any opposition. I think it's a sensible, business-like way of getting the job done. On an equally important note, although the reorganization of the former Minerals Management Service is moving forward, I am concerned that much of the attention is being focused on the leasing and enforcement side of the ledger, and that not enough attention is being paid to fixing the problems associated with revenue collection. That is why I have called for better auditing of the resources that energy companies are taking out of the ground to ensure that taxpayers are fairly compensated. In 2008, the Government Accountability Office discovered that the Bush administration's lax oversight of the Minerals Management Service, or MMS, had created a, quote, culture of ethical failure and that MMS employees who were supposed to oversee management of oil and gas royalties were instead breaking rules and accepting gifts from the oil and gas lobby. In the past, the federal government has not done enough to ensure it is assessing and collecting the appropriate amount of royalties from oil companies drilling in public waters. So while oil companies are reaping record profits and consumers continue to pay sky-high prices at the pump, taxpayers may be getting fleeced and that must stop. We need to fix this system and recoup billions of tax dollars from the oil companies. We also need to make sure that oil companies pay for the damages they cause. That is why I have co-sponsored bills that would eliminate the cap on the amount of damages an oil company is responsible for paying for an oil spill involving its facilities and allow greater access to the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund which is financed by a per barrel charge on produced or imported oil to the United States and helps cover the government's course for its emergency response activities. Both of these measures are key recommendations from the National Commission's report and are important ways to hold accountable those who are responsible for spills and make them pay the full cost of recovery. It is also important to note that the moratorium on drilling did not slow down production in fact, domestic oil production has increased to nearly the highest level in a decade. And current drilling activity in the Gulf of Mexico continues at near historically high levels. There may be some modest temporary decline in the production from the Gulf of Mexico as a result of the deep water horizon spill, as Secretary Salazar testified at the hearing I held last month. But this is due to the need to ensure safe exploration and production. Last month's Interior Commission's forensic report found that the blowout preventer's blind shear arms, the, the equipment's final line of defense against an oil gusher, could not seal off BP's well as designed because the drill pipe had buckled in the initial blast. Therefore, it is important to develop new rules to improve the performance of subsea blowout preventers to avoid a repeat of last year's spill. The discussion over drilling will continue especially as gas prices stay at near record highs for the month of April. And in response, the oil industry continues to push increased drilling as the solution to reducing gas prices, even though the U.S. Energy Information Administration has repeatedly stated for years that offshore drilling, in their words, would not have a significant impact on domestic crude oil and natural gas production or prices. According to the EIA, even with increased drilling, there would be no impact on prices of the pump by 2020 and only a three cent per gallon difference by 2030. We cannot drill our way to cheaper gasoline or to achieving oil independence. The United States consumes 25% of the world's oil production, but with only 1.5% to 3% of the world's oil reserves. We cannot meet our needs by simply producing more. This point is further highlighted by the fact that even during times of ample domestic supply, demand in China and India and the unrest in the Middle East continue to raise U.S. oil and gas prices. We must continue to pursue viable long-term solutions to reduce the overall cost of driving our cars, heating our homes, and powering our businesses. One of the most effective ways is improving energy efficiency through weatherization and increased fuel efficiency standards. For example, last year's vehicle efficiency and emission standards will save consumers more than $3,000 in fuel costs over the lifetime of new vehicles. Increasing the standard to 60 miles per gallon by 2025 
could result in $7,000 in savings. Our competitors in China and Europe already have higher efficiency standards. It is time that we create manufacturing jobs here in America by producing cars that save consumers money at the pump. And I've been heartened to see our auto industry begin to do just that, but we need to do more. Investing in clean, energy efficient technology over the long term will strengthen our security, help families save on their energy bills, and create jobs here in Rhode Island. It's a question of competitiveness and making smart investments. On a bipartisan basis, we need to start recognizing that slogans like drill, baby, drill aren't a substitute for a balanced, well thought out energy policy. I look forward to hearing what comes out of today's conference and working with you as we continue to address these very important matters. Thank you and good luck. While we're getting computers switched over here, I'm just very briefly going to introduce the uh, moderator for this panel, Professor Dennis Nixon from the University of Rhode Island, good colleague, friend, and member of my Marine Affairs Institute Advisory Board. And he has the, uh, the admirable, uh, challenging, inspiring job of uh, corralling a very esteemed bunch of panelists. So again, we're going to do very quick introductions uh, so you can actually hear the panelists and we'll sort of get out of here on time. But please take a look in the program at the, at the bios of the speakers that we have here. Uh, and don't forget to do your evaluation form for me on your way out. Thank you, Susan. Uh, just, just a couple of brief words. Uh, we do have a really incredibly <laughs> diverse and important panel for you right now. Uh, Fred, who's going to lead off, has been called by no less an authority than ABA Journal as uh, John Wayne in a pinstripe suit. I love, I love that line. Uh, John, John, he recently finished about a month ago as chief counsel for the National Commission on the BP Spill. And he's also the attorney that I, we have to uh, <clears throat> give credit or blame for uh, winning the case uh, for George Bush against Al Gore in that disputed little election they had in Florida a few years back. Uh, you see, uh, Al Gore was more popular here in Rhode Island. <laughs> the only guy you'll ever see who's been hired by both Bush and Obama, so. <laughs> <laughs> John, Waldron is, is, John Waldron is one of the most uh, well-known maritime attorneys in the United States. He currently represents the Marshall Islands, which was the flag uh, of the uh, Deepwater Horizon. Uh, an, an, it was, uh, uh, he, his firm, Blank Rome, has been involved with the maritime issues for many years. Uh, Tom Galligan, uh, taking to the academic side, now is a college president, I guess a recovering law, pro law school professor, uh, who then, uh, not uh, having enough grief as a dean, uh, right, Dean Logan, went on to become a college president. <laughs> and, and then finally, representing the Natural uh, Resources Defense Council, David Pettit. Certainly the NRDC has been, uh, if you study environmental law, uh, the group that has its name attached to more cases involving uh, that issue of keeping the public interest involved in regulatory matters. So it's a diverse panel, it's an exciting panel, and I want to give Fred all the time he needs. So go ahead, go ahead Fred. And I'm, I'm going to cram about a two-hour deal into 15 minutes. I don't talk this fast in front of a jury or I would have been out of business a long time ago. So I'm, but I'm going to move fast, you're all smart and you know a lot of this. In 1989, the Piper Alpha rig blew up in the North Sea. 160 men died. The rig was producing 300,000 barrels a day. Imagine the lost business. Uh, I went over there, lived over there for a year. We had, the British government had a year-long trial, and we wrote, we wrote, the judge wrote opinions with all of our help, which changed the safety regime in the North Sea. When the government contacted me about doing the same thing here, I thought, gee, I've worked in the oil business for years. I've represented all these guys. I think they're basically good guys. Good guys make mistakes. I make them, you make them. And I said, maybe we can change the safety regime in the Gulf of Mexico. As you'll see, BP and the other oil companies were just like most big companies. They had safety manuals this thick. They had organization charts piled up this high with responsibilities. They had decision trees. They had training. They had databases. They had all this stuff. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, the men that made some of the fateful decisions that night were about 15 feet from here to here from where the rotary was, where the explosions happened. 
They didn't think they were being careless. They did not think they were making money, risking their lives for the guys in London. Now, how could this have happened? Okay, my job, the president gave my group the job of, of, cons of ascertaining root causes. So I, we stayed away from liability. Uh, you can read my report. I'm immensely proud of it. You can draw conclusions from it. But uh, my job was not to pin liability on any of the companies. Root cause. What happened so we know how to stop it? And we submitted two reports, my chapter four in the commission's report, and then about three or four weeks ago, a 325-page chief counsel's report that spins out all the engineering. This is the most complicated engineering I've ever personally dealt with in my life, and I've done a lot of this kind of thing. It was, it was really, really hard to tease out what happened down there some 18,000 feet. This is a deep water horizon. It's a ship. It, it, it's, it's got its own power. The Coast Guard has jurisdiction. It's got a captain. They can steam it around the Gulf, and they can take it over to Bahrain if they want to. It's controlled by uh, satellites uh, running thrusters underneath it. It's not a moored rig. It's a drilling rig, not a production rig. Okay, there's the rotary where the, where the oil and gas came up. That is the driller shack right there. In that shack were highly experienced transocean uh, tool pushers and drillers. They made a lot of these decisions. They knew, they'd been around a long time, and they knew that if, if, if they made a mistake, it was curtains. Eleven men died, and eight or nine of them were right there, and a, a, the others were a floor below. So everybody that died was right there. The BP's chief engineer, by sheer chance, happened to be on the rig that night. Guess why? The rig was receiving an award for an unparalleled safety record. BP had an unparalleled safety record. Guys with clipboards go around every day. And they're looking for, is there, is there uh, oil on a, on a steel step or something like that? There, you can almost argue there were so many guys with clipboards going around giving them a good grades because they didn't have oil on a steel step that maybe they missed some of the big points. Okay. This is the Macondo well. This is the, the, the rig is up here. It's a mile down to the sea floor. It's 18,000 feet down to the pay sands. Down here at the bottom is, you can see, that's where the hydrocarbons got in the well. You'll see a little cement job down there. This is 18,000, this is 13,000 feet up to here, and another 5,000 feet up to the surface. The pressures down there are, are 15,000 PSI. A barrel of gas down there is 1,000 barrels in the riser. Things happen fast if you get a leak. And they knew that. This is no surprise. So. We're going to go through quickly what happened. Three things happened. One, the cement job at the bottom failed. The, the hydrocarbons could not have gotten in the well if the cement job hadn't failed. Impossible. So we know the cement job failed. That is a story that I could talk to you for a week about, why the cement job failed. But it failed. The second thing that happened is there is a test. When they, when they put in the cement job, it was the only barrier. They took out all the drilling mud down to here. So the only thing keeping hydrocarbons in was the cement job. They had a test they run on the cement job. They take, they, they reduce the pressure inside the well so that if the cement job's weak, the pressure inside is lower, the pressure in the, re, in the reservoir is 15,000, you'll get hydrocarbons in the well. They, they admit that they fouled up the negative test. They admit it. Uh, BP admits it. Uh, Transocean says we don't train our people in, in the negative test. But the cement job was critical. The cement job failed. And the test that's run to be sure the cement job's OK was done wrong, number two. Number three, about 40 minutes before the explosion in the evening of April 20th, the guys on the surface in that drill shack, remember I told you, started getting some strange pressures. With the pumps off, the drill pipe pressure was going up. Normally, when you turn the pumps off, you're, you're circulating mud and, 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 and seawater and things through the well. When the pumps are off, you expect the pressure to go down. The pressure went up. In hindsight, the pressure being observed in the drill pipe was a pretty good measure of the pressure in the reservoir. Now, nobody thought of that at the time. These, these 
men with families, highly skilled, highly trained, highly experienced, stood there 15 feet away for 30 or 40 minutes trying to figure out what happened. They, 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 there was a red button here they could push that would have shut the well down, shut it in totally. They didn't push the button. We don't know why, because they're gone. It, it probably costs, if you shut in a well like this, it probably costs $100 million. But it was $100 million of BP's money, not Transocean's. I'm just quickly giving you the dilemma these guys are facing there. They didn't shut the well down until it was too late. After the explosion, when they shut in the well and, and went, tried to go through the drill pipe, it had moved sufficiently so that the blowout preventer, which is 500 tons and cost $27 million, couldn't do the job. Now let's talk, what I'm mainly going to show you, I could talk about the engineering forever. I'm an engineer and I love this stuff, but there's, there, there, these emails are amazing when you realize that everybody writing these emails is a graduate engineer. Most had master's degrees. These are, and nobody wanted to die, and they're not dumb guys, and they wanted to get it right. Okay, first, the re the BP had responsibility charts up the yin-yang, as we used to say in the military. Pages of charts. You, you, you can't always see these, but they had, you know, one color is I got a consult, another color is he's part of the decision team, and there's about 80 different things going down there. So they'd been careful, and they had the responsibility lined out. You know, this is perfect. Some guy had worked on it for years, and when you look at it, it's wonderful. When we ask people, what was your responsibility, they would say, I need to see the chart. When, when hydrocarbons are coming up the riser with the speed of an express train, it doesn't do any good to have charts you can drill down through. Something has to come into your head as you realize this is going on. So this stuff's all great, except it's worthless. Okay, worthless. I need to see the chart. This was a hard cement job, difficult, down 18,000 feet. There were all kinds of risks that we could talk for days about that made this a difficult cement job. Would it set up? Would it not set up? That kind of thing. These risks were all known. You know, Halliburton does the cement. Halliburton's the best cement company in the world. These guys did not want to do a bad cement job. But they knew there were a series of risks, and they knew that they, the cement job there could be a problem. So look, let's look at the email. Okay, if the, the cement has to go all the way around the drill pipe to seal off the reservoir. It's down 18,000 feet. You can't see it. There's no video down there. Every decision is made by looking at pressures that are registered three miles up on the surface. That's hard to do. They were worried about this because you have to get the drill pipe centralized in the open hole. If it's over against the side, you can't get cement around it. Maybe you'll have a leak from the uh, formation. So they're, they're worried about it. And he said, even a straight piece of pipe in tension won't seek the perfect center of the hole. That means it might not be centralized. They had 14 other risk factors. They knew it might not be centralized, and this is the BP engineer that says, who cares, it's done, end of story, will probably be fine, and we'll get a good cement job. We'd rather have to squeeze and get stuck. Now, squeezing means repair the cement job. There's ways that you can shoot shotgun shells through the casing and put cement in if it fails. This is a recognition that they might have to fix a cement job. This is a recognition made three days before the explosion. These guys are master's degree engineers guys, and they knew the cement job might be bad, and they knew that they were taking all the mud out of the well, and they knew that this was the only, the cement job was the only thing preventing a blowout. They knew this is no surprise that people have read my report. It's clear in there. Now, why in the world did this guy write this? It's a good man. We'll get to that at the end. You'll see more of these. You, you'll wonder why people whose lives and lives of their friends and everybody turned on these things, why do they say it'll probably be fine? I'll give you a little hint. I think it's got to do with today's email culture. Okay, Transocean in the year before, just six months earlier, had a similar 
when I say similar, that might be unfair. If I say something here that's different from what my report says, go with my report. They had an event which was similar. They learned in that event that, uh, that during a displacement, well control is important. Tested barriers can fail. That's the cement job. It failed. You got to maintain well control. And when you underbalance the well, which they were doing, you got to watch out. Okay, so they sent out, they had all those reports. What do they do with these reports? Did they send them out to the guys on the rig? No. They had a database. When we ask people, they say, well, it's in the database. Again, in today's world, people think that if they get something sent to Joe, that, you know, it's off their desk, it's somebody else's problem, or it's in the database. So the guys on the rig that night didn't have the warnings of a similar event that had happened in the North Sea you know, just five or six months earlier. Uh, contractors. Uh, contractors. We need to get his boss and demand a permanent replacement. Jesse's too slow. You'll see again and again, there are 15 or 20 different contractors on the rig. There's only two or three BP guys on the rig. All the rest are transocean and contractors. There's great issues as to who's in charge. You, you, these, everybody wants to point the finger at somebody else. But there's a, there was a, a tendency to say, well, the contractors are experts. They're, they got master's degrees in engineering. So we'll worry, you know, this, even though this guy is, uh, isn't getting his job done, uh, and, th and they say this doesn't give us enough time to test the slurry to meet our needs. This is two days before the explosion. The slurry is the cement job. They say that we don't have enough time to test the slurry, but they pump the slurry down and pump the job. And you can see this is not just one event, it's one after another after another. Temporary abandonment, this is very tricky. I'm gonna go through this fast just to give an idea. Uh, they were gonna uh, leave this well, shut it in, and then come back and produce it. This well, which would have cost, guess what the well would have cost all in? Quick guess. Drill. Come on. Guess. Huh? $200 million. Guess how long it would have taken to pay out? Six months. Okay? I mean, this is, you can lose a lot of money here quick, but you can make a lot of money here quick, and that's, that's why people go there. Okay, abandoning it. When they started out on, this is April 14th, we don't think they should have been changing the abandonment rules so fast in the last few days. They were going to have a cement barrier here. It was going to be put in second. The next thing they do is they change it around. The next two days later, and they move the barrier way here. They're going to put the barrier in farther down. And finally, they don't put the barrier in until after they displace the mud. Drilling mud weighs about 15 pounds per uh, gallon. Seawater weighs about six. They took all the drilling mud out. Just, it just looks like mud, but it's, it's more complicated than that. And they replaced it with seawater. The mud was, if the cement had failed, the mud would have held the hydrocarbons in down that long shaft, you miles and miles of, of mud. But when they took it out, then the only barrier they have was the cement job. And instead of putting an upper plug, they were going to put two plugs in, an upper plug up the wellways, 3,000 feet down. They waited and changed at the last minute until after they'd taken all the seawater out, all the drilling mud out, and put seawater in, which means the only thing left. There's nothing holding the, the hydrocarbons in except the cement job. And you see what they were thinking about the cement job. Good. This is April 17th. Uh, this is a BP from the, the, the well site leader. Over the past four days, there's been so many last minute changes. We're flying by the seat of our pants. The well site leaders have come to their wits end. It's chaos, it's insanity. What's my authority? BP had done a reorganization. They'd shifted around, I could spend again an hour on this, but they'd done a major reorganization. The well site leader is the BP guy out on the rig. He said, it's chaos. I don't know what my authority is. What am I supposed to do? I was a soldier for eight years, and the key thing is who in the hell is in charge? And there wasn't a clear idea of who had authority to do what. You can, you can read it here. Uh, what, the answer, the guy sends this in, Saturday. What's my authority? I need to know. His boss, 
I got to go to dance practice with my wife. We're dancing to the village people. Now, it's, it's, it sounds, that sounds awful and cruel. I've looked at emails for a long time, and this is not a bit surprising. These are good men. I've talked to them. They cared. Sims, the guy that was at the dance practice, was on the rig that night. He would not have been on the rig that night if he thought there was something wrong with it. Okay? They didn't think in their heads that something was wrong. That's what's so interesting. Okay, this is the Transocean deal. The, what happened is the mud, the, uh, the gas came up and went right up to the top of the rig to the mud gas separator. That's a very frail device that exploded and they had the explosion. They could have diverted it overside, put it overboard. They had a manual, which this is like on page 115, and if the flow rate increases, send it overboard. You know, they had to have in their head, do it now. Nobody's going to leaf through the manual for 115 pages to see it when an express train of oil and gas is coming up the riser. I'm just pointing to a series of things. Again, this is about a two-day deal to really understand it. What's one of the biggest surprises? Sensors. You'd think in today's world this stuff could be sensed. This is what the driller saw, and this is a critical time. And it goes from top to bottom, and as you can see here, it, it's the drill pipe pressure is going up a tiny amount. And then they turn the pumps off, and it's still going up. Now, the, the Transocean guy said to me when I cross-examined him before the commission, the right man had to be the right place at the right time, looking at the right data, and he had to keep looking at the data till he saw the changes. We know that you can have technology with algorithms that can pick that sort of thing up right away. Now what BP does, which is fine to explain this, they flip it sideways and blow it up and then you can see it. But this is what, at the end of a 12-hour shift, a, a, one of those two pushers in that shed sitting there 8 feet, 20 feet away was supposed to pick up. Temporary abandonment. They're, they were going to move. They were going to set the plug at 8,300 feet instead of 3,000 feet. Nobody had ever set a plug, the upper plug, that low before. <laughs> Setting it low means you're taking out a lot more drilling mud. The answer, answer shoreside seems okay to me. Now, again, that one guy says the email and gets off his plate, another guy answers it, and they each think the other guy's a graduate engineer and the other guy's doing his job. There, the point I'll get back to is there was not a leader. Leaders take charge. They take responsibility. They do it themselves. Okay. About two minutes? One minute. <laughs> so, uh, to me, the lesson here is more regulators would not have made a difference. You could have had 100 regulators on that rig that night, and it would not have made a difference. Okay? It wouldn't have. The, the problem was that really smart men who knew this stuff and knew what could happen didn't make the right decision. Nobody I've talked to, a lot of companies want to talk to me, because everybody does, everybody who does process, uh, processes has these problems. And I said, there's just two things here. People have to be responsible. When something bad happens, they have to say, I'm going to take charge. Nobody did that. Nobody was, they all were dealing with other smart people. They were colleagues, and a leader didn't step forward. Number two, this email culture. I do it myself. I send, you see you smiling. I send it to an email out to one of my partners and it's taken care of. And he says, well, Fred's thinking about it. I'm glad to know about it. But there's, there's less incentive for somebody to take charge and fix it because you can just zap emails around and then if anything bad happens, you sub silencio kind of think, well, I've got that covered. Okay? That's, so you just heard my condo well 10 hours and 15 minutes. I hope you got something out Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. That was that was a very exciting presentation. Uh, if John, that's exciting. You need to get a life. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is, this, I get excited over this stuff. Uh, John uh, is going to be addressing the uh, principal uh, point we've got for this panel. And that's legislative changes. Uh, last summer, uh, there were hearings going on every day in virtually every committee of the Congress trying to figure out how to change the law. In fact, the House of Representatives actually repealed the Limitation of Liability Act of 1851 we heard about. Didn't get anywhere in the Senate, but that was a major change possible that was going to happen to this industry. Uh, 
we pointed to the fact that the $75 million limit on offshore structures seems kind of low in the context of $40 or $50 billion of damages in this case. So there's a lot of things that have been spoken about, but in light of all of the investigations that are still underway, there has now been a remarkable pulling back by the uh, Congress in terms of any legislative changes uh, that are being proposed. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a good thing that Congress has other things on their mind right now. Uh, but at any rate, uh, John, as soon as those graphics come up, is going to hit the issue of what legislation uh, was proposed and perhaps which ones he think might be uh, appropriate and uh, helpful for the safety of the uh, U.S. offshore oil industry. John. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, and what I'm going to try and do is give you what I'm going to try and do is, is, is do basically two things. One is show you what the reaction is. Uh, we know, we, what we've learned over the years is that, uh, good or bad, we, we react to things. We don't look ahead in the future as well as we should. And there's, a, there's an incredible backlash, if you will, and a reaction immediately, and I think you're seeing that moderate a little bit. But I want to talk to you about the, about the result of investigations and the regulations and what BOEM, and, you know, we t we're struggling with what the, the acronym means. Some would say it's bummer. Uh, for them, but it's not a good name, but BOEM is probably is one I'm going to use. Uh, I'm going to go over these pictures fast. This gives you a better, good, better perspective. There it is out of the water with one of these vessels which can actually carry the, the rig. That's the deep water horizon. Someone else has already shown this graphic. It's a really, you know, unfortunate picture of the Gulf of Mexico from satellite. So the, react, the immediate reaction is everybody's got to investigate. And uh, as you've, you've heard from Fred, the President's National Commission kept its schedule, basically. A report was released recently. Uh, what's still going on is the joint investigation. The final report is due on July 27th. Uh, this was kind of a sleeper. People don't even know what it is. A Coast Guard Incident Specific Preparedness Review. Um, we got the Department of Justice criminal investigation, congressional hearings, multitude of legislation. And on costs, what are we talking about? BP has already spent over $19 billion on response, $20 billion for Gulf Coast claims. How much in NERDA claims? Unknown. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all these to you, but the reason I'm putting this up, you're going to see I'm going to, this is the uh, HR 3534 called the CLEAR Act, uh, was passed by the House in August 2010, um, or just before August 2010, which is prior to the recess. The Senate uh, then took up the bill, they had their own, is introduced by Senator Reid. There was a lot of consternation about what the limits of liability should be, and what people need to understand, you look at the last, last bullet there, is that there is only so much insurance to cover this. And if you get, provide unlimited liabilities, which is what we've talked about, you're only going to have the big players left. You're going to have the BPs. You're going to have the shells. So it's going to limit the playing field. And there was a number of senators who were looking at some kind of a mutualization agreement between the industry to come up with a funding system in order to deal with the future limits of liability. This is extremely very, still very, very controversial. Um, most of these provisions I'm going to show you are on the maritime side, and I'll explain why in a minute because I'm going to talk to you about what BOEM has done in, in, since the spill to improve safety uh, offshore. But a lot of these things are immediate reactions. Uh, one of the things that wasn't covered, for example, is damages to human health under Open 90. Um, there, there were, there's an incredible, uh, what people don't under, understand is that the United States doesn't have the vessels and the capability of vessels to build them offshore. Most of these vessels are foreign flag, foreign built. And the immediate reaction by Congress is to say, well, the foreigners don't know what they're doing. Deepwater Horizon was foreign built, Marshall Islands fly, they all, they all ought to be U.S. And they've introduced all kinds of legislation that would require everything to be U.S. owned, except there's no capability to do that. Um, they would add costs of federal enforcement actions would be, would be added to the definition of removal costs. These were all things that were passed by the House last year. Increase maximum penalties, evaluate response plans. Interestingly, as you've heard here today, and as many of you know, the way the Open 90 setup is that the Coast Guard is required to direct response activities, 
but the uh, private industry is supposed to have the capability to respond, this provision would make the Coast Guard give them the capability to act as a first responder. I'd like to see Congress pass the money for the Coast Guard to, to take on that role. 730, 731 is very interesting. Uh, kind of like, what, is, what are they doing there? Well, if BP had wanted to bail out, they could have bailed out that company, declared it bankrupt, and then there had been no money. This provision would, would make would allow um, you to go all the way up the tiers of ownership of a company like BP to make sure that money is there from the responsible party. Now this is the, uh, the Senate version, again, which was not passed. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of provisions on response planning, <coughs> repeal of the Limitation of Liabilities Act. These are all things that were both in the bills. A uh, very interesting one, uh, the Exxon Valdez, when the, one of the final uh, actions was to limit Punitive damage is basically to one versus one and compensatory. This would allow unlimited punitive damages and make it retroactive to before the spill. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Number of the provisions for penalties that would have made things retroactive to, be, to before the spill. So where do we find ourselves today? What about 2011? Well, Congress has added again. They've introduced a lot of bills. Uh, no action has been taken yet, really, uh, on any of these to consolidate them. Very interestingly, um, Representative Markey, early in the year, his bill is impl implementing the recommendation of the BP Oil Commission Act. Well, what, it, what people have not, if you haven't focused or read the bill, what they don't realize is that a lot, of these a lot of these provisions that we saw in the House bill, who were introduced by Congressman Oberstar, were literally just picked up and put in that bill. So a lot of these, some of these nasty provisions, some would say, are, are in play. I just want to go back here, and uh, what, one of the most important things to understand in the legislation is that the key person right now uh, on the House is Congressman Lo Bionda, who's the chair of the Coast Guard Committee. And uh, I've been in, in his office, I've heard him talk recently, and there's a different attitude uh, in, in that I think that, that the Congress today wants to make sure they do whatever they do is right and doesn't have implications they're not aware of. So I think we're going to see them wait around a little bit more to take in all the information from the various investigations. And this is why it's important. They're going to be looking at what actions that the BOM has done. And I, what I've done is I've put a, cr a chronology here for you, which kind of shows you what BOM did as a result of the spill, obviously to try and improve uh, the safety issues out there. So in June, they came up with new safety policies. And NTL means a notice to leasees, lessees. So these are requirements for the operators out there. So they required additional requirements for blowout scenarios, worst case discharge calculations, and plans. One of, the, one of the problems we have with uh, what people don't, probably don't know is that all the response planning requirements for vessels are done by the Coast Guard, and the old MMS did these. The Coast Guard requirements have very detailed requirements for how you respond to a spill. Basically, the BOEM requirements just said, what you, you, the operator, just submit a plan, and whatever it says is fine, and they sign off on it. No detail at all on it. This was very important because um, right after the, the incident, uh, BOEM did an did a uh, report to the president on safety measures that would be required and they, inter they uh, implemented that on October 14th which basically is the improved safety measures for drilling regulations, blowout preventers, well casing, and cementing. So these are things that have been in place, this one since October 14th. They also came out with a final rule on safety and environmental management system which basically brings into play third party, uh, third party auditors. One of the things that you heard Fred talk about is, is a safety case and I'll talk about that in a little minute because one of the things that that Congress is looking at and BOEM is changing the way we do business in the United States and look at what Norway and, and the, the UK are doing the way we operate offshore. So what do you have, the investigations, you've heard of the national, uh, the, the Presidential National Commission reports are out, the findings are out. We've got the joint investigation their primary purpose is to investigate and determine the cause of the accident. They've publicly gone out and said the report is due no later than July 27th. But there's something going on behind the scenes here, and it may very well be that we're going to, the Coast Guard wants to put out some kind of report. I understand it's fairly substantial, and there's their deadline, or they're, what they're shooting for is to come out on the anniversary date, April 20th. So that's something we want to look for. Uh, I mentioned this uh, Coast Guard report, the ISPA report. 
It's very interesting. It's the purpose of these reports is to assess Coast Guard preparedness process and initiate corrective actions. The problem is that 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 the convening uh, order for that they basically have uh, various uh, private. Uh, experts as well as other agencies prepare this report. It's not really a report prepared by the uh, by the Coast Guard, and frankly, it put the president on report and a lot of other people for what the way this bill was was run. Now, now you've got what's going on with Department of Justice. So you've got civil penalties, uh, and people are watching this very closely because there are penalties up to forty-three hundred dollars per barrel of oil spilled. And you've heard all you were if you've seen some of the presentations here today it's like well how much oil really came out nobody knows but if you find gross negligence and using the figure that the government's come out with that's a 21 billion dollar fine <laughs> criminal investigation you don't see anything on the news about that because they can't talk about it but the doj guys are um are part of the uh, the, the multi-district litigation they're part of the, the joint, inv joint investigation by the Coast Guard. They're reviewing all this information, and they're going to be looking at grand, juries, grand jury presentations and come up with various charges. Um, in an unprecedented move, it's never happened in an environmental maritime case, the, in the entire uh, task force is turned over from the environmental crime section to the criminal division. And um, these manslaughter charges, is a, it's called the Siemens Manslaughter Act, which is, goes way back to the days when all the vessels offshore were, were basically steam plants. They'd blow up and a lot of people got killed. Um, this statute was dormant for a uh, hundred years or so, but in the last ten years it's been quite common in the maritime world where people will, char will get charged for manslaughter for, for, for deaths. And it's a very pretty simple test. It's a negligence standard and people can go to jail for, for ten years for this. So I think you're likely going to see manslaughter, manslaughter charges. And they're looking at any, any of the statements that Transocean, BP, and others have made, which may have been false statements, like, for example, how much oil was really come out, coming out of the well, and how, what did BP really know? Now, I'm not t trying to tell you I, I have any idea what ultimately DOJ is going to do, but you can rest assured with the elections coming up in the fall coming up here that, that, that the um, Department of Justice wants to be very secure that whatever, ch whatever charges they make are defensible and that the administration doesn't look bad. So, where does that put us today? Hey, I mean, after, after what we've seen, the people, the people that were killed, tragic incident, the amount of oil that was spilled in an unprecedented incident that nobody could forecast, what are we going to do to fix things? And how long is it going to take? Well, as I alluded to, the Republics are now in charge, and they're more of a wait and see. And they're going to wait and see what comes out of the joint investigation report. They've got the National, President's National Commission report, and they're going to assess it, assess it, and then they're going to decide what to do with the legislation. It took Congress 18 months to pass any legislation after the Exxon Valdez, and I would think that would be as soon as we'd see anything here, probably, very possibly, we'd move into next year. And you've got to take into consideration all the, the pro, proactive work that BOEM has done to put, in, to put in safety requirements. So Congress is going to look very closely at what the Coast Guard does and what, um, what BOEM has done before they enact any legislation. Uh, what I hear from people in the industry is that if you look at the National Contingency Plan, look at the way the response went, it, it wasn't broken. It worked pretty well. There's certainly major things that can be improved. And major training needs to go on as to how things are supposed to happen in that, but that's not like it, all the things we learned over 25 years were lost. But clearly we're going to see uh, uh, looking at limits of liability. I don't know what the number is, but if you get above $2 billion, you've got a real issue out there as to how, how, can, how, how can anyone fund that unless you're self-insured. Limitation of Liability Act may go away. Response technologies, we need improvements in those areas. Response containment and planning standards, we need improvements. So I think that is where we're going to see things play out. Predictions is, a, is only a prediction, but I think where we see the investigations coming out, I think that's what I see is the, is the fundamental timeline. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, John. Uh, Tom, you've got the floor to talk about some maritime tort liability? I sure will. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, it, as you all know, it has been about one year since the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon. 
Uh, it's also been about one year since the birth of Gordon Jones' second son. The baby was born about two weeks after the explosion. Now, Gordon Jones wasn't physically present, present at the baby's birth. I'm sure he was there in spirit, and he was there in the delivery room, but in a picture frame. But he wasn't there physically, and he never will be, because Gordon Jones was one of the 11 workers who was killed when the rig blew up. Gordon Jones was a 29-year-old mud engineer on the Deepwater Horizon. But unlike 115 others, he never got off. Now, if you ask his father, Keith Jones, who's a lawyer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, about it all, he'll tell you that one of the hardest things about losing his son, one of the hardest things about not having his son present for his grandchildren, one of the hardest things about it all for him is not knowing where his son's body is. There was no chance for the family to ever tangibly say goodbye. So the Gulf really is a graveyard in the literal sense of that word. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about the rights of Gordon Jones' wife, his children, and his parents. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the rights of the families of the 11 men who lost their lives on April 20th, 2010. Now, it is fine and right for us to analyze all that went wrong, all the failures leading up to the explosion. It's fitting and proper for us to consider the human failures, the corporate failures, the technological failures, and the regulatory failures. It is most appropriate for us to consider how we might try to prevent something like this from ever happening again. It's interesting to speculate how Congress might still respond in terms of regulations and new contract terms. It's fascinating and it's frustrating to watch and participate in the legal wrangling over claims for property damage, for damage to natural resources, for lost state revenues, and for economic loss. And it is instructive to compare the efficacy of alternative dispute resolution methods with the traditional litigation model. But in all of that fine, right, fitting, appropriate, proper, fascinating, frustrating, and instructive conversation, Let's not lose sight of the rights of the families of the 11 workers who were killed. So what are their rights? They're basically two relevant laws. The Jones Act, which through a 1908 statute called the Federal Employers Liability Act, gives a seaman a negligence claim against his employer, and it grants the seaman survivors a wrongful death action when the seaman is killed as a result of the employer's negligence. Now, why does the Jones Act even apply? Because as my friend in the suspenders said this morning, the semi-submersible rig is a vessel. The Deepwater Horizon was a vessel. So folks who have a substantial employment-related connection to that vessel are treated like seamen. They are treated like sailors. So the Jones Act applies. Now the second statute which is relevant is the Death on the High Seas Act, which applies to any other death occurring on or resulting from an injury incurred on the high seas. Now as such, DOSA, Death on the High Seas Act, governs the deceased seaman's relatives' high seas wrongful death claims resulting from an unseaworthy condition. So back to the question. What do the relatives recover? They recover their economic loss. For the lawyers in the room, they recover their pecuniary damages. What's that? Net loss support. So let's take Gordon Jones. If, after he cashed his paycheck and whatever he paid for his car, paid his golf club dues, went to see a baseball game, he took the rest of that money and he contributed to his family, they can recover that net loss of support. What else do they recover? They recover lost service. So let's say he did the cooking for the family and now they have to hire a cook. They recover what they have to pay for a cook. Let's say he did the cleaning. They recover what they have to pay for the cleaning. Let's say he coached his children's golf team, little league team, skiing team, although he did live in Louisiana. They would recover the cost of the coaching. They would recover net loss inheritance. But as the president of a small endowment, tuition-dependent private college, I would ask how many run-of-the-mill working people in America today expect their children to have a net inheritance. Anyway, that's what the relatives recover. What do they not recover? they recover nothing for the loss of the relationship itself. They recover nothing for their loved one's loss of care, comfort, and companionship. They recover nothing for their loss of society, 
From the law standpoint, from the standpoint of the Jones Act and the Death on the High Seas Act, the relationship itself is worth nothing. Now tell that to Gordon Jones' wife, who looked him in the eyes one afternoon and said that she'd love him for the rest of her life. Tell that to his sons, who will only know him through stories and through pictures. Tell that to his parents. Friends, that relationship has a value, and the law ought to recognize that value. All right, so it doesn't seem to me it's fair, just me. But is it up to date? Maybe even if it isn't fair, if it's up to date, it's okay. It's not up to date. When did Congress pass the Jones Act? 1920. When did Congress pass the Death on the High Seas Act? 1920. When did Congress pass the Federal Employers Liability Act? 1908. The world was a different place. The world was a tougher place. What's the majority rule today on land in the United States of America? Loss of society damages are recoverable in a wrongful death case. The Jones Act and DOSA should adhere to that modern majority rule. So, at least according to Galligan, your guest, the current rules are both unfair and out of date. Add to that, they are inconsistent. There was a fellow, his name was Ralph Waldo Emerson, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, a philosopher. He said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Now, he sometimes gets misquoted. People say, consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. But we lawyers know it's only a foolish consistency. How is the no recovery rule inconsistent? Let's start with the same worker who was doing the same job that Gordon Jones was doing, except he was doing it on land. He was a mud engineer or a tool pusher on land. What would his relatives recover against a third party tortfeasor? Loss of society damages. Let's say, Fred, you talked about the fact that this is a rig and that it isn't a permanent platform. Let's say it was a permanent platform. Then that means it's not a vessel. What would apply then? Well, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of technical law, but what would apply then is something called the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. And the OCSLA, we, you know, admiralty lawyers, we like these letters. The OCLSA would borrow the adjacent state's law. What does that mean? It means it is as if it were on land. So if the relevant state followed the majority rule and allowed loss of society damages, the OCSLA would borrow that rule and loss of society damages would be recoverable. Now let's look at perhaps the most foolish inconsistency of all, the commercial aviation disaster. Uh, some of you are too young to remember, but there was a, an airplane, Korean Airlines Flight 007. I think the panelists may remember that flight. Flying over the high seas, deviated into Soviet airspace back when there was Soviet airspace. The, the Soviets did or didn't warn to get out of the, the, the Soviet airspace. The plane didn't. The Soviets shot. The plane went down. Everyone on board was killed. Ms. Zickerman's daughter was killed. She filed suit in an American court seeking her loss of society damages. Her other daughter filed suit. The daughter didn't support Ms. Zickerman. But she did give some limited funds to her sister in order to take care of her, I think it was her niece. The mother recovers nothing because of the Death on the High Seas Act, but the sister's claim goes on because of that relatively minor uh, support that the daughter provided. A few years later, a, a plane, Korea, a TWA Flight 800, crashed as it took off from Kennedy eight miles offshore. Congress didn't want a repeat of uh, KAL Flight 007, so what did it do? It retroactively amended the Death on the High Seas Act to make loss of society damages recoverable for the survivors of those killed in a commercial aviation disaster. Everybody else, no. Commercial aviation disaster, yes. You're killed on a cruise ship, I don't want to make you nervous no loss of society. You're killed on a semi-submersible rig, no loss of society. You're killed in a helicopter crash, no loss of society. You're killed by some yehu on, off a cruise ship when you're taking a scuba diving course in the Cayman Islands, no loss of society. You're on a commercial aviation disaster, oh wow, loss of society. It makes no sense. 
It makes sense, certainly, for the survivors of those killed in a commercial aviation disaster to recover loss of society. It makes no sense to not award those rational damages to others. Now, by undercompensating, I'm a torts teacher after all, or at least I was, we fail to achieve justice and we increase risk. Torts is about what? It's about corrective justice. It's about fairness, it's about consistency, it's about compensation. But it's also about deterrence in an economic sense, isn't it? It's about making people pay the costs of their activities. And if we don't make them pay the costs, or if we don't make them pay the full costs, rational economic actors, Fred, great people who want to do great things, are going to rationally perhaps not do them because they do not face the full cost of their activity. Now, and I don't mean to rant and rave too much, but um, undercompensation, under deterrence, and increased risk in this setting are exacerbated by a wonderful law that I think you've already heard about, the Ship Owners Limitation of Liability Act of 1851, which allows a vessel owner to limit their liability to the post-accident value of a vessel as long as the accident occurred without their privity or knowledge. What happens to the hull insurance? That goes to the owner of the vessel. That does not become part of the limitation fund. Why did we do that back in 1851? To increase investment in American shipping and maritime commerce. What was true in 1851? Were the bankruptcy laws as sophisticated and as developed as they are today? No. Was the corporate form as sophisticated and developed as it is today? No. Who even ever heard of a limited liability company? Do we still need a law that limits liability to the extent that the Limitation of Liability Act does when all those legal developments have happened since then. And oh, by the way, most of the ships and rigs on the high seas are not American ships. Finally, finally, in Congress when you do this, they have little lights. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow lights on. Yellow lights. Right, right. And then it goes red and you hope somebody doesn't come and pull you off. Finally, all these problems of under deterrence could be solved perhaps if punitive damages were recoverable. And they are recoverable, but as you said, uh, Exxon Valdez case written by my friend and neighbor Justice Souter, limited recovery of punitive damages in most maritime tort cases to a one-to-one -one ratio between the punitives and the compensatory damages. It's not a constitutional decision, it's a maritime tort rule. Now, what does that mean? It means potentially that a jury and judge are deprived of their traditional flexibility to tailor a punitive award to the appropriate facts of the case. Now last summer, your Senator Whitehouse proposed a bill, a maritime punitive damages bill, that would have restored the court's traditional ability to tailor a punitive award to the facts of the case. It didn't pass. In closing, let me say, last summer, the House passed bills that would have repealed the Limitation of Liability Act, but more importantly, at least to me as I speak today, that would have amended the Jones Act and would have amended the Death on the High Seas Act. Those bills got out of the House about a, two weeks after they held a hearing. We still wait for the Senate to do anything. So I admit that I, I have an interest in this, not a financial interest, but an intellectual interest. But I hope next time when we look at your slide as to what the predictions are, we'd see a prediction that the law would be amended to change the Jones Act and the Death on the High Seas Act to award fair compensation to the families of the 11 people who died. Thank you very, very much. Very compelling argument. Uh, and now, uh, as the last word uh, on a day full of great presentations, we'll hear from the NRDC and what your thoughts might be uh, on the entire subject of whether or not this <laughs> law needs to change that might uh, actually protect the environment a little bit better. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, may it please the court. I'm, uh, I'm a litigator with NRDC, and usually when I'm at a podium, I'm addressing people in robes. So if any of you has a bathrobe around, you know, you throw <laughs> it on, it, it'll make me feel at home. Um, uh, my boss, uh, Frances Beinecke, uh, was also Fred. She was on the President's Commission, was also Fred's boss. So I guess that makes us brother wage slaves, at least to a certain extent. We, uh, my job at NRDC is basically to sue polluters and make them cry. 
and that's that's what we try to do. I got involved in the Gulf case. My normal, my day job, so to speak, is uh, air pollution and environmental justice work. I got into this case because I had tried, while in private practice, a number of oil industry and oil spill cases. I actually worked on the Exxon Valdez case from the Exxon side of the table. I represented Shell for years in private practice, and I agreed they're good people who work there. They didn't, Exxon did not want to drive that boat onto the rock, and in Shell cases, it often involved groundwater pollution. Shell had no interest in polluting the groundwater, and their attitude was, hey, if it's ours, we'll clean it up, but if it's not ours, we won't, and I, I didn't have a problem uh, with that. Um, and so with that experience, um, I you know, volunteered to help out at NRDC if there was Gulf litigation, and as you know, there's been uh, plenty. I want to talk here briefly about uh, four things. One is the environmental community suggested reforms to Congress and to uh, Bomer. Um, one is the, uh, the, the natural resource damages assessment and how it's going from our standpoint, our standpoint in the environmental community. You heard it described at some length uh, this morning. I think that's more of an idealistic uh, view of what's happening, and I want to talk about what I think is really happening during that. And um, I want to talk uh, last about the recently issued permits. Bomer has just issued a number of permits for new exploration. Uh, and I want to talk about those, and lastly, how NEPA and other environmental laws uh, play into those. Um, uh, I think Jonathan outlined for us very well what's happened in Congress, but I, you know, it, it just strikes me as incredible. President Obama referred to this oil spill as the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history. And what Congress has done can be summed up in one very succinct Yiddish word, which is bupkis. <laughs> Bupkis means beans, and you can get the, you know, my daughter says, ain't got bupkis, um, and that, you know, that conveys the idea. They haven't done a thing. Um, what our main ask has been, uh, and made easier for us in a way after the commission issued its report, um, is implement the suggestions. Just write them down on a piece of paper. There's an executive summary, and they've got bullets and stuff. Write them down on a piece of paper and do that and we'd be very happy. I have no confidence that that's going to happen uh, in the current conference. Maybe Jonathan has more, and I hope he's right. But I have no confidence that's going to happen uh, in the current Congress um, at all. We um, uh, specifically, you've heard uh, talk about um, the $75 million cap. We've asked that that be uh, eliminated. And yes, that probably would drive some of the smaller players out. But my view is if you can't afford to clean up your mess, you shouldn't be there in the first place. Uh, there's a, a fairly obscure uh, rule in Oxlo, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, that requires Bomer to act within 30 days on permits for exploration. These permits are extremely complicated and have become more so given the recent regulations that you also heard about that require a lot more work from the oil companies, including very uh, uh, complex calculations about worst case uh, oil spill scenarios and where that oil is going to go. You know, when you've got a basically underfunded agency anyhow, giving them 30 days to do anything is um, is tough, and what that does is it puts a lot of pressure on the agency to approve them. Because in today's environment, if they deny a whole bunch of them, that all you know, it's going to all hell's going to break loose in the media. People are going to go to Washington and be upset. Not people like me, but oil company type people. Um, they've I've talked to Michael Bromwich about this, the head of Bomer, and he said, you know, we'd like at least 60, and maybe longer. Uh, I think that's more than reasonable given what they have to do. Um, I don't think that's going to happen either. I don't think Congress is going to touch Oxla, at least um, in, in, this, uh, in this term. The, the last ask we've made, and this is also uh, referred to in the commission report, although I want to put a slight refinement on it. Uh, there is, Bomer is going to hire a chief science officer, which I think is long overdue. What we have asked is that that person have veto power. I mean, you could word it more nicely but have the ultimate say in whether um, a lease is offered in a certain area and whether individual exploration and drilling permits should be uh, granted. And that person, um, you know, we'd like to see it, somebody in NOAA, somebody who knows about um, 
somebody who knows about what the critters live out in the Gulf and where they live and how sensitive they are to spills, what's going to happen to the currents and the like. NOAA has expertise in all of those areas and Bomer has, in, to some degree, consulted with NOAA, but they don't have to do now what NOAA tells them to, and I think they ought to. Um, I don't, um, again, I've talked to Director Bromwich about this. He's a very, very smart guy and very careful in the way he speaks. And he basically said, yes, uh, we're going to pay very serious attention to uh, what our science officer has to say. And I said, well, does that mean he has veto power? And he said, well, well, we'll pay very serious attention to what he has to say. So I think the answer is no. Uh, they'll pay serious attention, and then they'll do what they want to do. Um, so those are our recommendations sort of in a nutshell. Um, I think the other um, the national viral groups who are involved in this kind of stuff uh, are basically uh, in line with us. Um, in terms of suggestions, um, you heard a, a very accurate description of the changes that Bomer has seen since the incident. In terms of future changes, uh, there are two things that we're lobbying for, uh, which I'm not optimistic about um, either. One is, as a result of the recent technical report uh, having to do with what happened to the blowout preventer in Deepwater Horizon, it's clear to me that there is, there is a failure mode, an unrecognized failure mode in these things which has not been planned against. And every one of those blowout preventers that works in the same fashion, where you have the pipe going up the middle and shear rams that are supposed to cut the pipe and seal it, is vulnerable to this same failure mode where basically the pipe uh, warps off to one side and it jams the jaws of the shear of the ram, I mean, so that it can't close. To me, that's like driving a car with anti-lock brakes that don't work in a panic stop. You know, that's sort of the point of having anti-lock brakes, but, you know, if, if your fail-safe device has a known failure mode where it doesn't fail safe, it just fails, to me, it's irresponsible in the, at least irresponsible to allow future drilling until that has been studied and fixed. I read a, a comment recently by Professor B at uh, University of California, Berkeley. He's very widely been quoted on the whole Deepwater Horizon thing. And he said, look, engineers know how to fix this. They can fix this. Why don't they just, you know, they ought to just fix it. And I agree, let the people who know what they're doing fix this, and, but until we do, uh, my view and my organization's view is there should not be new drilling in the Gulf. The second thing we've asked uh, Bomer about is what happens if there is another incident? How are you going to ensure that the oil companies clean it up? <clears throat> well, in the recently issued permits, Bomer has signed off on the following. The oil companies say, we have a system. Great. You're good. Go and drill. Well, what is the system? Well, the system is a combination of two systems that are unproven and, as far as I know, untested. And I'll get back to the as far as I know in a second. Uh, one is run by a company called Helix, which was involved actually in the Deepwater Horizon matter. And one is run by, you've heard referred to earlier, a consortium of all the major oil, uh, oil companies who've gotten together and, and cooked up this fairly complicated system where basically the oil can be recovered, uh, whereas the helix system, it's just going to put a cap on. The, um, again, I asked Secretary Bromwich, you know, when you guys, they did a so-called inspection where Bromwich and Salazar went down to Texas somewhere. As far as I can tell, they kicked the tires and stuff, um, and that's about it. Uh, they saw the equipment on dry land. And so I asked him, have you done any tests on this? Do you know of any tests where these things have had some kind of real world, you know, a dynamic test as opposed to a tabletop test? It seems to me the tabletop test is useless unless the table is under 10,000 feet of water. <laughs> and he said, no, why, we, we haven't. And I said, do you know if these companies have? And he said, no, I don't know. Why don't you ask them? So I did. And what did I get back? Bupkis. That's, that's where we are. So I don't know, as I stand here before you, whether these things have been tested or not. And in my view, um, unless and until we know that, that's another reason that we should not be permitting new <coughs> drilling uh, in the Gulf. When you read the worst case oil spill scenarios that the companies are now uh, required to submit, the, uh, the Shell permit that was granted recently, the Shell said uh, it would take us 109 days to drill a uh, uh, to drill a well that, I'm sorry, to drill a, a well, you know, in sideways that will actually, a relief well that would kill 
the, the, the wild well, and that's assuming the blowout preventer doesn't work, nothing else works, and they have to drill a relief well, 109 days, and um, they estimate in this particular well that the volume of oil that would, that would be spewed out in that 109 days would be a multiple of the, of the amount of oil that we saw in the Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster. And you know, uh, contemplating something like that, where the only thing that's standing between you and 109 days of massive oil pollution in the Gulf is a blowout preventer with a known failure mode and two untested uh, oil containment systems, again, I think it's irresponsible in, in, uh, at minimum to allow new drilling in the Gulf um, at this point. Uh, we've made the point to Bomer. They've issued the permits so you can see how, uh, how strong our recommendation has been. Um, let, let me just skip ahead and say, uh, with these new permits, uh, we've been talking with a few like-minded groups about uh, litigation because our, our informal advocacy has gone nowhere. Uh, there's a number of potential avenues. Uh, there's jurisdictional issues. Uh, what goes in the Fifth Circuit? What goes in the Eleventh Circuit? Um, and uh, there's a big honk and NEPA issue, which is sort of front and center. I don't know if. If, if people here have much familiarity with NEPA, I'm sorry if you do. It's uh, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act basically requires an agency to take a hard look, is the operative term, at the potential environmental consequences of an action that's subject to NEPA. And there's really three ways you can go. You can give a categorical exemption, which is just this, and you stamp the permit, which, by the way, is how the Deepwater Horizon, the Macondo well, was permitted. No environmental review at all you can do what's called an environmental assessment, which is you take a quick look and you see if maybe there might be some sort of significant effect on the environment, and then you issue something, I'm not making this up, called a FONSI, and that is not the character from Happy Days, it's F-O-N-S-I, and it means finding of no significant impact, and then it's just, you know, go with God, go ahead and drill and you're good. And then the, the ultimate end, the, the big report, if you choose to do one, is called an environmental uh, impact study, and uh, no one wants to do that because it takes a long time and it's very expensive. And what Bomer did in all of the new recently issued permits is they went down Fonzie Street and they said, uh, we find that there's not going to be any significant impact. And, uh, even knowing about the blowout preventer issue, knowing about the containment issue, and um, when you dig in and ask, how can they do that? Um, and I'm not making this up. They do a probabilistic analysis. They look at all the oil spills that have happened in the Gulf and their frequency, and they conclude, you know, this really doesn't happen very often, so there's nothing to worry about. I'm not making this up. This is right, you know, this is within a year of the deep water horizon. Hey, you know, that really doesn't happen. And that's the, exactly the same thinking, in my view, that got us into this problem in the first place, is the regulators ignored a low probability, high exposure event. And if you, if you, uh, are doing, if you read anything about the Wall Street meltdown, I've been reading a couple books about this recently, you see sort of the same thing, that these, these fancy models that these PhDs in physics and the like, the quants made, they thought they had everything covered and the risk had been eliminated, but they didn't quite carry the line out far enough to where, I, um, you know, it's called sometimes a black swan event, something that happens very rarely, but if it does happen, you're in a world of hurt. And that's exactly the kind of thinking that happened on Wall Street and exactly the kind of thinking that happened in MMS and we're seeing now um, in, at uh, Bomer. So the NEPA issue to close this circle is, how can you guys do that? Are you kidding? I mean, it's basically an are you kidding argument to say there's not going to be a significant impact. Uh, you know, remember what just happened, you know? Um, and, you know, more analytically, You've got a, a passel full of environment of endangered species out there in the Gulf. You've got marine mammals, uh, you've got sea turtles, you've got, as someone mentioned earlier, the, the bluefin tunas uh, spawning grounds, the uh, uh, sperm whales, which are endangered, also protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. They like to hang out in Mississippi Canyon, which is where the Deepwater Horizon well was. And maybe if someone from NOAA had had some say in the matter, they wouldn't have drilled there. Uh, out of deference to or protection of the sperm whale, but that didn't happen, and, and I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, 
Let me just wrap up by saying we, we at NRDC and I, uh, the other major enviro groups are doing the same thing. We are advocating on two levels. We're advocating in DC. We've asked NOAA to make the uh, NRD, the natural resource damage assessment uh, process more open to the public. They keep saying good things, but they haven't done bookus to actually make that happen. You look at the website, and they, they have a few things they just put up, but if you're an ordinary person on the street, you're not going to figure out what's going on. We at NRDC are working with community groups in the Gulf to try to increase the opportunity, both for the public to give input and for the public to understand what happens in the NRDA process, especially when it gets to restoration, which is going to have an effect on their communities. And a lot of locals are scared that there's going to be a lot of money coming in and it's going to be sucked up by local politicians and given to those folks cronies and it's not going to help in the areas where help is really needed. So we're trying to work with that. Um, and uh, you know, when, when gentle advocacy at the uh, legislative and administrative uh, levels fail, we'll see them in court. Thanks very much. Due to the incredible efficiency of this panel, we've gotten back on schedule. <laughs> so that's a tremendous achievement. Um, and I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to ask uh, David and perhaps John to comment. Uh, David, I'm surprised you didn't mention one of the suggestions uh, in terms of the environmental community that uh, the United States adopt what countries like uh, Norway and I believe Canada have done in terms of their procedures in which any new uh, exploration well has to be accompanied by a relief well being drilled at the same time, which would address the issue of, a, of a, you know, the potential failure that, of the blow-up preventer that we have heard from several speakers. Care to address that? Yeah, we, I mean, we thought about that, about recommending it, and um, it's, I think the Canada example is actually not totally accurate. I mean, it was, that was, uh, it, you know, went around the internet, but like a lot of internet things, it was not, totally accurate. I think in Canada they need to have the uh, ability to drill a relief well and they have to say it's going to be this ship and this equipment and here's where it is now mm -hmm. and here's where how long it's going to take to get out there. And that's what Helix and the Marine Containment, the Marine Well Containment System folks say that they have. Mm -hmm. So if that system actually works, I think it's the equivalent of what they have in Canada. The uh, uh, Someone who's uh, more into the industry than I am can probably give you numbers, but it's also hideously expensive to drill a relief well basically at the same time, even to keep the ships on station. And, and at a certain point, uh, we, we, this may sound funny coming from me, but we need to be realistic about what Congress is going to do in, in the face of oil company, uh, powerful oil company opposition. Mm -hmm. Okay. You kind of mentioned? Well, I, I actually agree pretty much with what you said, and I don't think that's a, a real standard anywhere in the world today other than in our ice areas, and I don't know for sure on that, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I think what is concerns me is I, uh, and this was before the, you know, the National Commission report, we have this uh, report done on the blowout preventer, and there's still a lot of questions about that, and, it, and BP has gone into court and asked for more testing, and the court's granted it, and it sounds like it needs more testing, and the testimony that came out uh, on that about that seems to indicate that they didn't answer all the questions. There's a lot of unknowns. But what what what? And I'm not an expert on blowout preventers, but one of the things that I'm hearing from industry is that a blowout preventer is not really to stop a uncontrolled well. A blowout preventer is an operational device that is used to to the rams are supposed to uh, you know stop uh, the well at certain times for operational purposes. But they're really not designed. If you have a complete blowout of a well and you've got the oil and gas gushing out, it's a little late. <laughs> you should have figured that out ahead of time. It's you? really amazing. If you, you imagine a pile of sand and you put a garden hose on it and it would immediately erode it away, we've looked at the jaws of the blowout preventer and we've looked at the pipe and the, the, the force of this sand and oil and gas coming up that riser so fast erodes away this carbon steel just like a garden hose in a pile of sand. Once, once you've got gas in the riser, it's over. And, and the fact that you had this pipe that was stuck up in there, there's still issues as to whether or not what really happened. They don't have any physical proof. They did it through model calculations. They don't really know. But um, if you really need to be able to stop uh, the, the, wet, the uh, flow of this well, then you've got to be able to uh, anticipate that something might get stuck in there and the ram has got to be made physical enough to break through wherever it is. And so the standard 
the standard isn't really sufficient today, it sounds like. The two <laughs> sides of the ram weigh almost a, a half ton each. I'm not sure you could build a blowout preventer that once you had a blowout it would stop, but the whole idea was something bad's going on and you've got five different uh, deals. You've got two annular preventers, you've got two pipe rams, and then you've got the shear ram. So you have different levels of stuff you can do if, if bad stuff starts happening. Right. I, I think one of the, and I did not get a finish, I mentioned it ahead of time, but what they do, you know, what they learned in the Piper Off and these other cases in the UK and Norway is, in the United States we call it prescriptive regulation. We have these standards that we set in the United States, and a company can go, I meet the standard. But in this technology offshore, improvements go this fast. None of our standards keep up with it. So what they require in, in Norway and in, in the UK is you do a safety case, which is done by third-party auditors. And your safety case is based on your particular well with the technology that's available today. So that keeps you up with the modernization. I think what we're, I'm not sure where we're going to end up on this. I'm not sure if Congress will ever come through with or not. But you'll never get away from prescriptive regulation in the United States. But you supplement that with a safety case type of analysis, which is third, third party audits and stuff. Prescriptive and, regulation means you're always fixing something that happened a month ago. Exactly. <laughs> so, so when you talk about what the, you know, where, how you really improve this, these are the things where we have to get over, you know, have to take it to the next level. And I don't see that it's unclear whether BOEM is going to adopt something like this. It's unclear if Congress will ever get around to it. And, you know, you heard it. I mean, my slide said there are eight deep water wells. There's ten now. I mean, you've got this, you know, and the average American, let's think about this. The average American's going to the pump today, and he's paying $4, over $4 for gas. So he wants to see oil. I mean, what's the political pressure on this? What's the answer to all this? I don't know. In Congress, I mean, we got the budget. There's no money. You think they're going to they're going to give money to the agencies to do more stuff? They mentioned the, uh, the getting permits. Uh, you mentioned getting permits done. This is really interesting. For a well like Macondo, BP probably had 30 engineers, maybe half of them PhDs, working for a year on the well design. I mean, these guys, they want to get it right. Then they submit it to Lafayette, and the guy sits there. Right. One guy. Right. He, could be this, he could be God of engineers, <laughs> but he, couldn't, he could not possibly do what it took 30 PhDs a year to do in 30 days. Maybe he can't do it in 60 days. I mean, maybe instead of, I, I do not obviously believe in regulation. I believe you have to make something so costly that people don't do it again, but it's, ground, it's reasonable debate. Question all of that. Yes, sir, please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Mike Dixon. I'm the executive editor of the Ocean and Coastal Law Journal at the University of Maine School of Law. I'm very happy to put a plug in for our next issue, which is going <laughs> to collect a lot of articles addressing these very topics on the oil spill, um, so look for that. Um, but also I had a question about, uh, if I can try to ask a two-parter about the other Jones Act. Um, one, I think it was sort of a little esoteric kerfuffle in the midst of all the kind of cleanup. I was wondering if you could comment on that and whether it would have any impact on some of the changes we've heard proposed today. Uh, and then secondly, Sort of looking forward, whether it might have any impact uh, with all the reference to Mr. Graves' observation that we're still going to be focused on oil for decades to come, but in terms of alternative energy development offshore, especially in the outer continental shelf, um, and I think that would have to Well, the other Jones Act kerfuffle had to really do with the coastwise trade and, and what ships could fly in coastwise waters, and there, the, the, the controversy was as I recall it, was should the United States allow foreign vessels in to engage in skimming and other rescue efforts. I think there's just been a conclusion either today or yesterday that uh, that it, it would not have done much to have had the foreign ships in and that they weren't being denied because we wanted American ships doing that work, but because there were other problems with the foreign ships. That's a totally, it's the same statute, but it's a different issue than the Jones Act. Uh, negligence and wrongful death benefits. It happens to be an area I specialize in. I, I do get a lot of rulings. It's custom service which grants the rulings. It's completely bogus, everything you heard in the media. People don't know what they're talking about. The Jones Act does not apply offshore with regard to skimming operations. The Jones Act applies to skimming operations within three miles. There was no need for foreign flag vessels to operate within three miles. There's enough U.S. capacity. So the Jones Act didn't apply offshore. And that's been confirmed, right? Right. That would, yeah. That's how it works. Uh, with regard to alternative energy, um, I just got it. No one has asked the question as to whether or not the Jones Act applies to a foreign flag vessel installing a wind turbine offshore. And the reason is because the Jones Act says it has to do with, with uh, oil and gas resources 
from the outer continental shelf. Well, when you spend a wind turbine, you put it in the seabed, the resource is the wind. Nobody's asked customs that question yet. But I can tell you through informal discussions, my own legal analysis is the Jones Act probably doesn't apply. But then you got the issue, if you get a ruling, what's Congress, you think Congress is going to allow the foreign flag vessels to operate out there? Don't know. Probably saw the story, the Brits have, have got 4,000 turbines they put out in the North Sea and various places. Wind didn't blow this year. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. The turbines were supposed to produce, let's say, 11% of their electricity. It's like a half of 1%. Just interesting. They need more lawyers to generate more hot air. Chris. <laughs> 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 Well, the, uh, the, the Open 90 uh, was pretty well locked up in Congress until the famous tanker trilogy weekend in the following year when three vessels, including the World Prodigy, hit uh, Brenton Reef here in Narragansett Bay. And in one of those remarkable twists of fate, each of those groundings happened in the districts of key members of Congress. <laughs> That really advanced the cause, and yet at the very last second, resistance over the double bottom provision of Open 90 once again stopped the law until one more casualty. Can you want to name the vessel? The American trader bringing Alaskan crude oil to Long Beach in the process of raising its anchor. There's two ways you raise an anchor. If you're on a ship, you want those flukes pointed away from the bow, not in. And they pulled their anchor right up through their single bottom hull and polluted a massive amount of Long Beach Harbor. That following Monday, the maritime industry gave up its opposition to double bottoms. And at that point, the law passed Congress. But it took four more major pollution incidents after the Exxon Valdez to actually get all the people that need to agree for that law to pass. So, so is it I would like, can I add something? I tried the American Trader case for the state of California, yeah. state court in California, and in that case, the oil was owned by BP. Alaskan <laughs> oil, and BP stepped up to the plate, and they did everything you could have asked them to do. They settled all the natural resources claims. The, uh, the holdout, and the reason we went to trial, is that the shipping company decided, um, although they had, in fact, sat on their anchor twice, and they had a pilot on board, too, um, they did not want to play ball with us. So we uh, went to trial and we tagged them good. So is it accurate for people that keep saying Open 90 and Exxon Valdez are one and one? Well, the other, yeah. history, the other thing with, with Open 90 was there was always, there was a lot of maritime legislation that was being, was, uh, being negotiated, but nobody is, as Dennis points out, never, there's enough, never enough impetus. So it was, they quickly rushed to put things together and you kept having these hiccups with it. It's true, it's, it is ironic that we had these continuing incidents which resulted in Open 90 finally being enacted. Right. And we heard, we heard it today, you know, Congress focus. And so Congress has lost its focus on this area. And, you know, More there's... On this area. Yeah, there's, I mean, and, and, and listen... Yeah. Oh, this way. Well, and, and maritime, in the maritime area, Congress is, the maritime issues are always the lowest priority. You get to everything else before you get to maritime anyway. I'll tell you a little story that will make you angry. Really. So everybody had subpoena power but me. The uh, Coast Guard, incidentally, who's now subpoenaed all my records because they want, would like to write a report someday. So the Coast Guard, the Chemical and Safety Explosion Board, the Justice Department, everybody had subpoena power. I don't have subpoena power. So uh, I go to, uh, I have a congressional liaison person. You don't know what these commissions are like, so we go to meet. The House passed the deal, I get subpoena power, one to Senate, with it, just in a day. So we go to the Senate. I won't tell you the names of the senators, I go to meet a couple of senators. I'm sitting in the room with this senator, Republican guy, I'm, I'm middle of the road type guy, and there are like 10 of his little weenie 20 year old aides sitting there. <laughs> he says, well, Mr. Bartlett, we couldn't give you subpoena power because this is a very liberal commission. And I said, uh, he said, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you just probably go after President Obama. He said that to me. 
I said, any of you kids ever know how to use Google? Yeah. <laughs> they said, what do you mean? I said, I got a computer, Google me. I represented President Bush in Tallahassee. <laughs> I said, I'm a middle of the road guy. They didn't, they, they wouldn't give subpoena power because they assumed I was a, I'm not kidding. And I'm a middle of the road guy, but that is, and I said to the senator, I said, do you care anything about human life? Dead quiet. <laughs> puts his head down. I said, don't put your head down. You care about human life. They don't give a shit. Well, all of the bills that they I- They don't! Fred, all of the bills that I testified on died in the Senate. They got out of the House, they died in the Senate. Now, we did okay without subpoena power. I mean, I'm not complaining. We next, next question. Yes. <laughs> I have such power away for us. Um, there's a wonderful article in the New York Times Magazine of uh, the hours just before uh, the incident and, and the attempt of the crew to recover. And so if you want a shorter and more vivid journalistic uh, report on what happened that and Mr. Bartlett gave, I would, uh, I would commend you uh, to that report. What uh, struck me at the time I read that uh, magazine article, and again, uh, listening to Fred, uh, was to compare that low probability, high risk event to another kind of low probability, high risk event, uh, which is an airplane going down. So the odds of an airplane going down, in fact, the odds of an engine going out are just pretty small. So Sully Sullenberger is flying his airplane out from LaGuardia, and both engines are taken out uh, by birds. So, you know, what is the odds of that? I mean, catastrophic. Yet, um, when you listen to an interview uh, of him, because uh, he had a book, so he's been interviewed a lot, um, he explained something that just hit me as extraordinary. Um, he had not met his, uh, 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 the other pilot in the plane until that day. And they knew each other for about 15 minutes when they took off, and yet, without talking, they go into this mode of reaction, which is programmed into them because he explained they have to practice it. Uh, and that's a regulation. They're required to practice for this event. So he explains that he took over uh, the handling of the airplane. This is all practiced beforehand. His pilot then reached into a notebook, which is that thick, and went to the exact page for landing in the river, because that's what Silverberg told him to go to. He knew exactly where it was, he knew the page, and he went down one by one the procedures the Sullenberger was supposed to do, he reminded him, just in case he didn't remember, that you got to flip that switch and go to that red button. Is there any reason we can't train these crews to do the same thing? You know, they do. They have all kinds of training and they have simulators. And Bill Riley, uh, who was the, one of the heads of the commission, we talked about this a lot. And we talked about the nuclear industry because they've got really good programs overarching. And Believe it or not, with these deep wells, there is an order of magnitude more things that can happen than in a nuke. In a nuke, there's only so many things that can go wrong. There's a bunch, but they follow a pattern. Same way in an airplane. There's a certain number of things that can go wrong. I'm an engineer. I was stunned by the complexity of the, but not only the science, but the engineering in these things. And I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's a whole bunch harder. That's all. I, I think from a torch perspective, it, it's, it's, you ask yourself, very, very low probability of extremely great danger, what's the benefit of doing this and we do it? I think in events like this and events like, like nuclear disasters, you have to ask yourself, the, the high damage that might occur, can you stop it once it starts? And that that may be a little bit different than a quantifiable, terrible thing that happens and for which there's full compensation, and I won't repeat my sad story about whether there's full compensation here, but it's a little bit different if you think, and we can't stop it once this starts. Well, one leader could have easily stopped this, and I'll wind this up with a little, if I can, a real, real quick story, and I told, told a lot of people this story on the commission. I'm 21 years old. I'm a company commander of a unit in a place called Redmond, Washington. I don't have a guy on the unit but me that's, gone, that's graduated from high school. We have about 500,000 gallons of red fuming nitric acid, bad stuff. We have about 500,000 gallons of JP-4 jet fuel. It's a missile unit. We've got warheads you wouldn't believe. Commanding General comes down to me. I'm 21. He said, Lieutenant, it's you. 
He said, what do you mean, General? He said, nobody else here can save us here. If something goes wrong, it is you. You're the only person out of 160 people that you have to know everything yourself and you have to be ready to act. And I was scared. But there was no, if there had been somebody like that on the rig, that, this would have been easily stopped. There were seven or eight different times they could have stopped it. But no leader stepped forward to do it. I don't think you can make, making leaders is like teaching people to dunk. Good luck. <laughs> I'd like to thank the panel for this excellent afternoon and Susan for putting this whole day together. I want to thank all of you for coming, particularly. Please do an evaluation form on your way out. Uh, give Charlotte a big hug on your way out, uh, and keep us posted. Thank you.